Go ahead. Make my day. Clint Eastwood. Dirty Harry. Sudden impact. This is the fourth in the fourth entry in the Dirty Harry series. Uh, this is the only Dirty Harry movie directed by Clint Eastwood. Uh, I would love to eventually talk the original Dirty Harry directed by Don Siegel, but we already did already did one Don Siegel movie on our, our, our little movie mindset run here. Uh, but Sudden Impact, I would say, is like is one of the more interesting ones for reasons that we've talked about, but uh, may become clear. So basically, the movie opens and it's it's San Francisco, baby, and like uh, it's just nighttime helicopter shot. It's the my first note is Mario Kart ass music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh god. <It's>, yeah. <laughs> the, the opening credits. I, I want to point out that the opening credits for both of these movies are exactly the same. Yeah, one is Mario Kart, the other is Saturday Night Live music. <laughs> the music is inside an impact is by Lalo Schifrin who did yeah. the enter the dragon soundtrack, I believe. Uh, uh, but yeah, also to talk, you mentioned the like Clint Eastwood economy. Both of these films have multiple scenes where it just seems like they're not lit at oh, all. Oh yeah. I was, opening especially sudden impact. sudden impact. I was really yeah. struggling for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it opens and we are, you know, uh, high on the bluffs up the coast. We see the beautiful golden gate bridge and it's a, it's a man in a, woman in a parked car and as the camera zooms in we realize they're you know in a state of congress they're necking by the bridge the woman undoes his pants but instead of taking him out she takes out a gun and shoots his dick off (laughs) and then uh walks away and we realize it's sandra Locke. and now we really can't talk about sudden impact without talking about the real life relationship between clint eastwood and sandra Locke. this would be their last on-screen collaboration, and indeed the last movie Sandra Locke appeared in that uh, achieved any kind of wide release. So, I mean, uh, they had a, a fraught relationship, to say the, say the least, in her 1997 autobiography, The Good, the Bad, and the Very Ugly, A Hollywood Journey. She called Eastwood a completely evil, manipulating, lying excuse for a man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can I say, because I literally have that book right here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> there, there's an amazing anecdote in that book where she talks about uh, giving a custom, I just posted about this on Twitter, but she gives a custom made wig to a child with cancer where she like requisitions the Warner Brothers private jet to drive to Shelbyville, Tennessee to give a wig to a dying child who like loves Sandra Locke. And she spends so much time about like what an amazing person she is. And then Clint's just like, what the hell are you doing that for? You shouldn't be around kids with cancer. Like just like the most. <laughs> most evil version of himself that you could imagine. <laughs> so yeah, like uh, like they, they started their relationship. They made many movies together. And like Clint was, uh, Clint was married at the time, already had a couple kids, but it was sort of like, I don't know, the companion in marriage, they lived separately. And like Sandra Locke always felt like she was tarred with being like the other woman or breaking up a marriage. Needless to say, uh, you know, by her accounts, Clint treated her rather coldly. And uh, there's a lot of. Oh, she, I will say, was married. She, she was married too to a gay sculptor that she had a platonic marriage with, and this guy ran the game, baby. Like he lived off Clint Eastwood's dime for like a decade, where like he was like setting Eastwood was setting this guy up at a house in California, and it was like Sandra Locke's platonic husband, this guy named like Gordon Anderson or something <laughs> like that. Oh, that's so, so sick. Like, that's uh, yeah, the dream a- gig, you know, <laughs> just oh, totally, sculpting yeah. like Cox or whatever he was probably sculpting. <laughs> Doll, he sculpted dolls oh and Sandra God, Locke even. will spend <laughs> like n- nine pages talking about his doll sculptures and then be like, ah, then we made Sun Impact. It was okay. Oh, he's a twink. Clint is bottomlessly cool. Oh my gosh. Is there he? he was, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think he passed away. But. Oh, R.I.P. Um, <laughs> my, uh, John, another one of my favorites from the, uh, the Sandra Locke uh, <laughs> memoir is that she, she talks about how Clint in his movies constantly makes references to the Korean War to give people the uh, to give people the impression that he's a veteran who served in one of America's wars, but she mentions that uh, his military service during the Korean War <laughs> consisted of him being a lifeguard at a U.S. military base for a year. <laughs> yeah, and he would and he would screen movies to the GIs like he was a projectionist and lifeguard. <laughs> I love being on the idea of being a lifeguard for the U.S. military. It's just like, yeah. hey, no rough housing, no running by the pool. <laughs> The beautiful generals. Exactly. You have to screen movies for the beautiful generals. <laughs> P- pulling out, a, pulling out a Colt forty five because you guys are playing Marco Polo. That's actually <laughs> my um my grandpa grew up in Sicily during World War Two, and he told me a story. This is kind of tangential, but he told me a story one time of him when he was like ten or eleven, 
him and his three friends playing soccer against American GIs. And the American GIs lost so bad that one of them shot the gun with the shot the ball with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, not far off. <laughs> That's um, great. That's a nice like counterpoint to the armistice like Germany uh, Britain football yeah. game in World War One. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that, I mean that's the thing about America we don't like losing you know we, oh, yeah. we're a nation of winners we're, we're a nation of losers that uh, nonetheless has this psychopathic need to win everything all the time mm-hmm. and yeah. I, I guess just like I, like the, the, the Sandra Locke uh, like they're, they're, re, they're fraught real life uh, of romantic relationship and like how it relates to this movie is that this was originally written as a movie for Sandra Locke um, it was uh, basically uh, like it was supposed to be about her character and sort of like a serious movie about like a, like a rape revenge story or whatever. And then Clint saw it and basically uh, just gave it to his screenwriter. And they were like, yeah, we can throw Dirty Harry in here, too. And the, <laughs> the end result it really is what shows. makes this movie. <laughs> truly yeah, shows. The end result is what makes this movie baffling <laughs> and fascinating because it really is like two different movies in one. And one, the Sandra Locke story is this like really queasy like nasty like rape revenge movie and like the killings really like turned your stomach and then the other half is just dirty harry up to his old goofs and spoofs <laughs> have, <laughs> chopping it up having fun and everyone he kills in the movie is like a cartoon it's it's literally yeah. he kills frank pentanglia from yeah. the godfather at a wedding <laughs> he just gives him a heart attack by showing <laughs> <Yeah>. up <laughs> literally it is like it is like wiley e. coyote and roadrunner where clint is a roadrunner and he's like it's like there's this insane dissonance and I texted Will about this when I was watching the movie, but like there's this crazy dissonance of everyone telling him, we don't need people like you anymore. It's a different time now. And then meanwhile, he takes five steps outside and six people are trying to kill him. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. It's like, there's such like, and people are like, well, stop causing trouble. There's like 10 scenes where he gets reprimanded for trying to, for someone trying to assassinate him. <laughs> In the course of like three well, yeah, days. That's a, that, 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 that's a thing. Like you mentioned the opening scene, but it's like, it doesn't even come back to her character for like 25 minutes. It just <laughs> nope. becomes like a dirty, hairy short. <laughs> yeah. And this is the movie that gives us like, go ahead, make my day. And all those yeah. classic scenes where he takes out like nine guys who were robbing a coffee shop for probably $45. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, But then he, he essentially gets put on like forced R and R and goes to this seaside town where the two of them kind of link up, I guess. Um, this yeah, is they also link build in this movie. This is also one of my dad's favorite movies so when i knew we were doing it i i texted him i was like we're doing sudden impact on the podcast and he was like okay <laughs> does your dad restore antique carousels for a living <laughs> yeah he's he was really into the carousel parts of the movie <laughs> like not <laughs> you can take or leave the other stuff and you know like it's it, 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 it's 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 like a template like stock plot line in all the dirty harry movies of harry callahan being being chewed out, as you said, by like a, a procession of like the stupid police commissioner, the stupid judge, the stupid DA, the stupid human rights activists and, and social justice warriors. But yeah, it's just over and over again, Clint getting chewed out by being like, damn it, Harry, you, you can't do this. You're on forced leave. And he's just like, what do you want from yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> Burying those criminals cost the city $12,000. <laughs> <Like. laughs> and like, yeah, like, and the first time we see Harry, he's like, he's, he's late to court. He like he, he he turns up the court late and like as the judge dismisses a case against some some young punks. Yeah. Who like, you know, as she says, he was like, we, you know, in the eyes of the court, the evidence you obtained illegally doesn't exist. And he For lets the these, these episode, punks out subscribe and like they try to, they try to like, you know, uh, talk, sl- talk, talk sweet to him in the elevator. And he's like to me, punk. Your dog shit. And I'll <laughs> scrape up dog shit anytime I see dog shit on my shoes. Be careful where the dog long, shits uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then John, as you said, then he goes to get uh, his morning coffee, and notices that there's something amiss because the uh, the lady behind the counter just like dumps sugar in it, and he's like, "I've never had sugar in my coffee." And then like, Too oh, it's sweet. for the full Too episode. Sweet. It's because some, subscribe some at patreoncom slash chapo uh, trap black house. Youths are robbing this diner, so he just like goes through the back entrance, comes in, and shoots like six guys. <laughs> yeah. And then of course that, that's uh, that's when we get the the famous line: "Go ahead." Make my day. And what I love about the delivery of that line is that, like, at, at this point, like, it's one of the most iconic Dirty Harry, like, uh, one-liners. 
And it's like, it's not for the full episode. Subscribe at patreon.com slash chapo trap house. Oh, trap.